Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, welcome to episode 7 of Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I interview Scott King, writer, photographer, podcaster, overall creator. Scott has worked as a college professor teaching photography, digital arts, and writing. He now works full-time as a game photographer and author. As a board game photographer, he shoots games for websites, online stores, and for other marketing needs. Scott has also served as a reporter for the school newspaper, and even way back then, although Another student was assigned the article. He demonstrated his willingness to break down conventional barriers, like the ones in traditional publishing, and snuck into the press conference where Gary Marshall was meeting with local media. He asked hard-hitting questions. The next day, Scott was hired, and he's been working in the entertainment industry ever since, continuing to work relentlessly at producing the many novels and many nonfiction writing projects that he rolls out every year. Given Scott's multiple activities as a creator, we talk quite a bit about the balance required to juggle all of these different tasks and the different times of day when he works on creative processes and times of day when he works on those more mundane maintenance processes. But before we get to the interview, I want to talk a little bit about Uh, an announcement that was made uh, just this week on the Sell More Book Show podcast by Jim Kukrell about the arrival of Book to Pod. I am fascinated by what this means for authors, but thought that I might share some of these thoughts using Nigel, a British male, and Jessica, an American female. Take it away, Nigel. Book to Pod, which you can find at booktopod.com helps authors find new customers and grow their brand by turning their book into a podcast. Here is how it works. Step 1. The book is transformed into podcast audio files using text-to-speech technology such as my sophisticated sounding voice. Then, they create a brand new multi-episode podcast channel that includes professional artwork. Next. They publish each book chapter as podcast episodes that get fed to places like iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Finally, they provide a customer book to pod landing page to showcase your work. Wow, Nigel. That's great. It sounds like this not only allows authors a new venue to get more exposure and attention for their writing, but it also does something truly critical. Oh? What's that? Jessica? It saves them the entire process of having to learn how to create a professional podcast of their own. That allows the author to get back to focusing on the most important task they have, which is writing writing their their next next book. book. Thanks so much, Nigel and Jessica. That is what's most important, working on writing your next book. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is an amazing tool that writers can use. If you're curious, you can go ahead and test the service out for yourself with a sample of your own writing at www.book2pod.com backslash test drive. And that's two, the numeral two. Now, speaking of audio products, this podcast is sponsored by Findaway Voices. You may have heard my interview with Kelly Lytle from episode five of this podcast just a couple weeks ago. If not, it's definitely worth checking out. Now, Findaway Voices allows authors and small publishers the ability to create and distribute professional audiobooks at an affordable price and in an environment where you have control over the price. My own experience with Findaway has not only been positive, but I ended up earning money from retailers and library sources that I wasn't even aware existed. How awesome is that for a writer? You can learn more about Findaway Voices at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. But now... Let's get on to the interview with Scott King.
Hey everyone, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I'm here chatting with Scott King. Scott, welcome to the podcast. Howdy. Scott, just to start off with, tell our listeners a little bit about you, both as a writer, podcaster, etc. Uh, my name is Scott King. I'm an indie author and, and semi-freelance photographer, and then I kind of do a podcast on the side. Uh, for books, I have non-fictions, I have middle grade, I have thrillers, um, I'm about to launch a big fantasy series, so I'm, I'm just like all over. <laughs> all over the place, doing all kinds of fun stuff, aren't you? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so I mean, I, I believe, I mean, I've seen your work as a photographer, mm -hmm. and I know that you you write so many different things, you do non-fiction, you've got fantasy, you've got uh, young adult stuff, how do you balance uh you know all of that different work together i i'm i'm self-employed so i kind of make my own schedule is is the big thing and i am very much from the school of thought of i put the story and the art first i don't write to market i don't really have a publishing plan i kind of just work on what i want to work on um the only only difference to that is that every year i put out a a board gaming calendar and that has to have a kickstarter and it has you know hundreds of backers and, and because of it being a calendar and that, you know, has to do with the schedule, I do do that every summer okay. and then that comes out every fall. That's the only like hard thing I do that has to have a set schedule. Everything else is just kind of, well, what do I want to work on? What, what matters to me? And then I do it. So tell us more about the gaming calendar. How does that, how does that work? What is this? Um, well, for photography, what, what, the, the paid photography work I do is board gaming. Uh, publishers mail me board games. Okay. I take photos. Those go on Amazon, they get printed for banners at conventions, they get used for sell sheets to sell the board games overseas. And because of that, because I have so many board games, I kind of just started to put out a calendar every year. Oh, and really? so every summer I do a Kickstarter, and there's two versions. There's the base calendar where I pick the 12 photos that go into the calendar. Okay. And then there's the custom calendar, which I only do via Kickstarter. And because I have a pool of 300 some photos, backers can back it, pick what games they want in their calendar, and then I make them and they all get sent out. So, so are you saying each backer has their own unique version of the calendar? For the custom calendar, or for the custom calendar, yeah. Wow. So it's not, there, there's a generic one, but then there's the one where they're obviously um, paying for a custom one. So they get that. That is so awesome. So they have their own unique calendar that nobody else has. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's kind of fun. And, and gamers, they, they like the certain games that they like. So people pick their favorite games or they pick their wife's favorite game or they pick their husband's favorite game. And then they get to add custom holidays like their kid's birthday or their dog's birthday or something weird like fries and pies day. There's lots of weird made up holidays on them. Oh, that's fantastic. So I love the fact that, so, I mean, you're doing this work for gaming companies, obviously mm -hmm. you're doing this ongoing work, but you have these games already. So you're, you're leveraging, you're leveraging your, uh, access to assets and creating something unique and special that um and you obviously know your target audience very well in that area yeah and it's it's just nice too because being in the board game media the the basic way to get into it is that you're a reviewer and you review board games you're on youtube you do all that kind of stuff the problem is that by reviewing board games you have to sometimes be negative and it, it's really nice what i get to do because I just get to be like, hey, board games are awesome. Look at all these pretty photos. I get to be positive no matter what. And that, that's one of the things I really, really enjoy about doing it is that I get to, to show people who are maybe new to board games this awesome thing. And then the photos I take, they go to people's offices. They go in people's homes. Friends come over or coworkers come see them. They're like, well, well what is that? That's a board game? Board games look like that now? That is so weird. So it's, it's, it's nice being this kind of just bringing people in in a positive way. Oh, that's true, because the images are like a five-star review every single time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> For the most part, that's cool. So what, what's something, I mean, because you write as well, um, what have you taken from photography and how, that you've adapted into your, into your writing life? Is, is, are there crossovers between the two? There, there is, and, and actually in my, my fancy book, which comes out soon, I, I talk about this in the author's note, is that one of the things that's important with photography is contrast. So you have light areas in the photo and dark areas of the photo and and they they contrast each other so the the dark areas make the lighter areas look brighter and, and vice versa and i think that transitions very well into tone when you're writing if you have darker or grittier spots in your story that's going to make the lighter spots seem happier and more jovial and so for balancing my tone i thought that was very useful coming to that realization 
Oh, that's fascinating as well. Um, so you don't just do inanimate objects. I have seen your um, live action <laughs> photography from conferences, etc. How do you find the difference between obviously, you know, setting up a photo for a gaming calendar or then catching people in action, you know, speaking at a conference, etc.? Well, I, I, I rarely do paid photo work of humans because humans are, are paying the butt to work with. Okay. Um, <laughs> With board games, I kind of set them up, or if I do food photography, I just kind of set stuff up and make it look pretty, and, and I get to play kind of like when you're an author. You get to play God and move stuff around and make it look exactly how you want. The problem with humans is that you really have to get a performance out of the humans. Okay. Otherwise, it's just going to look like a drab photo no matter how pretty the lighting is or, or anything else. When, when covering conferences that I've done, I, I've tried to rely on the conference itself and like, okay, if this kind of moment is happening – Make sure I get the reaction to that moment. And that's what really sells the photos. Oh, okay. So, so you're looking at the way people are reacting to the thing going on. It may not mm -hmm. necessarily be the main action, but it's the reaction of that. That's interesting. Yeah. So in terms of, you, you talked about the, the, the deadline you have for the calendars. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's very, very fixed in a deadline. But then everything else, I mean, unless you're going to a specific conference to do, you know, uh, photography for the conference or whatever, how do you structure your writing and creative time? Um, the, the way I normally work is that in the mornings, uh, I get up, my wife's a chemical engineer, and so she has pretty set hours. And, and what's nice about that is when she goes to work, I go to work. So I drive to the local coffee shop. Okay. I'm normally there from like 6.45 to 10 or 11. And that's my writing time. That's when I write no matter what. Um, okay. Then I come home and I might have marketing to do. I might have photography to shoot. I might have publishing stuff to do. I just kind of do all the business crap then in the afternoon or even like podcasting and stuff like this. Okay. All right. Cool. So uh, you, you go, uh, I'm just curious, what do you use? Do you, are you writing out longhand? Are you a keyboard, a tablet? How do you, how are you getting that writing done? Uh, I am dyslexic and I have horrible handwriting on top of that. So I, I definitely have to use a laptop. And I, for years, I've been using a Dell Mini 9 that I hacked into an Apple. But Scrivener oh, wow. just updated to version 3 and it couldn't run that. So I kind of had to like just bite the bullet and buy my first real MacBook. And that, that's what I'm using now. Okay, cool. And, and, and obviously you're writing on Scrivener. Yeah, Scrivener. That's the, that's the preferred uh, tool of choice mm -hmm. on the platform. Cool. And so you're at the coffee shop. Are you, is it the same shop every day? Are you the regular? And they go, that's, that's Scott. He's the writer. Do people know that that's what you're up to when you're there? Well, we just moved. I, I used to live in Houston. And I now live in Pittsburgh. So I had my favorite coffee shop in, in Houston. Um, and it was called Brew and Bacon. And I was the regular. I had my one corner seat and everyone knew who I was. <laughs> now, now that I'm I'm here in outside of Pittsburgh. It's 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 kind of just starting over, and I do have a, a preferred seat and a preferred coffee shop. When we were picking where to live, like where to buy a house, we actually went around to five towns, and I tried out all the coffee shops to see which one I liked the vibe and the coffee the best. <laughs> and that was one of our main factors for picking where to live was who had the best coffee shop. <laughs> it's not just your wife's commute into work; it's your commute into the, the work at the coffee. Exactly. Shop. Yeah. So, so coffee is not just on brand for me; it is a way of life. All right. Now, I have to ask, since we're talking coffee, is mm -hmm. what is your preferred coffee of choice? Is it a certain style? How do you take it? They had a weird thing. I've only ever seen this in Texas, which I thought was wonderful. It's, it's called an undertow. And so what they do is they take espresso, they fill half a shot of espresso. Okay. And then they, and it all happens in a chilled glass. And then they gently layer the milk on top of that. And then you take it like an actual shot. Really? Yes, and I've never seen it anywhere else except Houston and Austin. And it was fantastic. So I, I loved the undertow. Other than that, it's just generally black coffee. Black coffee. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And that's, and that's your uh, preferred brew for writing. Uh, yeah. That's excellent. So you do the writing in the morning, you get that sort of that creative process in the, in the morning, and then you come back and you do some of the more, um, the maintenance stuff, the marketing, the, the not fun things. Yeah. The stuff that you have to get done. But mm -hmm. It's fun is writing. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So I want to go back to your writing. And uh, specifically, I, I I recently read online, you had a very intriguing response from a parent to your eye of Hastur. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Eye of Hastur? I, I believe it's Hastur. Hastur. The Eye mm -hmm. of Hastur, which is a choosable adventure. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. That, that was such a weird thing. So what, what happened is on my gaming calendar years ago, I decided to make up a, a weird random holiday in one of the videos on the Kickstarter. Okay. And I said, you know, National Cthulhu Eats Spaghetti Day. It was just a joke. <laughs> 
But the following year, people actually wanted to know what that was, and they wanted me to actually invent a holiday. So I said, okay, I'm going to write a book. It's going to be a guide on how to celebrate this fake holiday, National Cthulhu Eats Spaghetti Day. Um, and I went and had a Kickstarter for that, and I raised the money for it. And, and that's a published book. But one of the, the bonuses, the add-ons that happened when we achieved our goal is that I was also going to write a choose-your-own-adventure okay. set and tied into that book. And that's what the I Pastor is. And, and so weirdly enough, it wasn't something I had like planned to do from the start. It was never the end goal. It was just something fun and silly I decided to do. And, and that's what it is. It's like a Lovecraft-themed choose-your-own-adventure. <laughs> Lovecraft-themed choose-your-own-adventure. Yeah. That's fantastic. But there was a response uh, that you got from a parent mm -hmm. that I wanted to dig into a little bit. Um, okay. Could you uh, tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so, so it, it's been very weird because, again, it was never the end goal. It was just kind of something I've done. But it picked up way more than National Cthulhu Eats Spaghetti Day. And, and what has happened is that for some reason, it has really connected with a lot of kids who don't like to read. And the parents have got it for the kids, give it to them, and now all of a sudden the kid reads it, they go through all the different versions, and then they want to read more. Um, thematically, the, the book is very much, it, it is meta, it's kind of like a social commentary on choose your own adventures okay. and reading in general. So the only thing I think of is that just the, the subject matter itself just appeals to young boys. But in addition, it, it kind of thematically leaves the door open at the end and saying, okay, well, now go choose your own adventure. And right. it's suggesting, you know, go read more. So oh, I'm thinking maybe okay. that connects and, and that's what really sells it. Okay, that's cool. So with the success of this in terms of the popularity for, you know, reluctant readers, it's mm -hmm. a great, I mean, I went out and ordered a copy, you know, my, my son has been an on and off reader and I want to get him back into it. And I thought this is the perfect thing because he loves games mm -hmm. he loves playing games and he loves the interactivity so if i could combine the fun interaction where he can be in control with you know from a talented writer telling a fun story that could potentially get him back into it are there are there follow-ups that you plan on working on with this uh potentially uh again i was never something i was going to do to begin with but i left the door open that i could do a whole series or a whole line uh, i wouldn't mind doing one in my upcoming fantasy series and actually have it like part of the canon where the choices the reader makes in the book affects the real world of the main series. Again, very meta, very weird, but that's just kind of my thing anyway. <laughs> you, seem to, uh, you seem to enjoy uh, experimentation. Is that true? Yeah, I, I think that a lot of art and storytelling out there has been done, and that's just the way it works. And so if I'm going to get myself excited about something, it needs to feel unique or different. And that's just kind of how they happen. Okay. And let, can we go back to Kickstarter again? You'd okay. mentioned that uh, you're, you're quite experienced in using Kickstarter. What are, what are some of the things that you've learned uh, as a, as a creator, as a, I mean, as a photographer, as an author, you know, uh, applying Kickstarter, is there a right way to go about it? Is there a wrong way to go about it? Kickstarter has changed drastically from when it first came out. Like when I first started doing the calendar to where it is now. Um, back in the day, it used to be a service where if you had this great, amazing idea, you could kind of take it there and people would help you fund your dream. Okay. Where, whereas now, you really need to have a, a platform built and an audience already built in before you should go to Kickstarter because if not, it's just going to get drowned out with, with all the chaos that's already there. Okay. Um, so if, if Kickstarter is a viable option, but it really is only a viable option now if you already have that reader base or that fan base. Okay, so it's it's to build upon a base. It's basically a tool to use, to, so that base can help you with mm -hmm. that next big project. And so you use, but you also use Kickstarter as an interesting way for the for the annual calendar because you know there's a set of people who will say, "Hey, this is neat, I want one," um, and then there's going to be other ones who say, "Oh, this is neat, I want my version of this," mm -hmm. which is kind of a, a I think an interesting way to uh, to do that. And how is that done? Is it done as a specific level? Uh, well, well, for starters, the, the board gaming side of Kickstarter is huge. It's one of the, the most uh, money-grossing sides of Kickstarter. So there's a lot of board games who are aware and still use it, and a lot of publishers still use it. Okay. For, for how I break down mine is that there's the base level, or no, actually the cheapest level you can get is $10, and that's basically you get all my photos. It can use them as wallpapers for your tablet, device, computer, or whatever. Oh, that's cool. The, the next level is the base calendar, and that's the one where I pick the photos that go into it. And then the next level after that is the custom calendar where people can pick whatever holidays they want and whatever photos they want. And then I also sell prints and stuff like that too. 
Oh, that's kind of cool. That's neat. So there's basically three main base levels that you yeah. need for that, just to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask, um, and, and there's probably more than one, but you must be a board gamer yourself? Oh, yeah. yeah. We play out some board games. Okay. So what's, what's the one that uh, your go-to in the last month? Because I know it changes over time, obviously. Well, we just moved. So we, again, we moved from Houston to Pittsburgh, and my wife's a chemical engineer, and she's overseeing this huge new project and hasn't had a day off in 27 days. Oh. So okay. we've not played a board game since we moved. But oh, I have a stack, and I'm excited. The, the big one right now is Pandemic Legacy Season 2. Okay. Um, it's what's referred to as a legacy board game, which were invented by Rob Davio. And, and the way they work is that the state of the board game changes as you play it. So uh, you play it once, and then when you go back to play it again, maybe the next time you rip up certain cards or you open a secret package, and now there's new components and new rules to the game, and the game evolves over time. Oh, wow. That sounds fun. It sounds like something that you can keep playing it, and it's completely different. Uh, every oh, yeah, yeah. It's basically like playing like a campaign on a video game, but it's a board game. Oh, that's fantastic. So you, you must be itching, you know, 27 days, you've moved, she's been so busy. It's like, hey, during the Christmas holidays, this is what we're going to do. Yeah, I'm definitely excited. Um, she probably won't, her schedule won't level out probably till the end of January. So right now it's like, okay, I'm going to focus down hard on writing because she's working. So I'm going to get my working done. And when she has time off again, we get to explore the area, we get to play board games, we get to do all the kind of like normal fun stuff. Well, it's going to be a little bit chillier in January in Pittsburgh than you were used to in, in Houston, I'm sure. What's, uh, what are some of the other differences you've noticed uh, in this recent move? This, this whole region of the country is very different. So I grew up in Maryland in both Ocean City, Maryland, which is kind of like a beach tourist town, right. and then in D.C. because my parents divorced. Lisa, she's from New Jersey. So going to, to Texas to begin with was, was very fascinating and very different. Right. And what we found in Houston is that it's not like cliche Texas that you see in TV or movies. There, it is hugely diverse. Uh, I believe it's one of the most diverse cities in the U.S. Right. The, the economy there is booming because there's so many chemical companies, there's big oil, and it's the kind of place where if you are a hard worker and want a job, you can pretty much get a job. Uh, the, the houses are stable. The houses are realistic to buy. It's just, it's just a very nice economy. Where we moved to Pittsburgh, I, I didn't realize this ahead of time, is that when the steel industry crashed in the 70s and 80s, they never recovered. There's just empty towns. Like you drive by and there's steel mills and the mills are like giant airplane hangars that go on for like half a mile and they're just, just rotting. And then the town surrounding that is just abandoned or condemned. Wow. So, so this whole region of the country is, is very, very different as a result because we went from the booming economy to people are struggling to get a job, not because they're lazy, but simply because there just aren't enough jobs here. Because they, it was built on that industry. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. um, the other weird thing is that there's, there's a missing generation, and they actually refer to it as the lost generation. Okay. So when the industry crashed, people who were young kind of moved away to go find jobs in other places. And then that generation never moved back. So there's a gap in age from like the 30s up until like the, the 50s with very, very little age in the middle. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's like a lot, a lot of old people. And wherever you go, it's just old people because there are no young people in the middle. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. So I, I have to ask, since you're, you're in Pittsburgh, have you discovered the institution that is the Prementi brothers? Um. We, we went to the original one once, I think it was five years ago, okay. and we haven't been back yet just because it's been so crazy since we moved here. But, but food-wise, they put French fries on everything here. Like, we thought it was just Promantis, or maybe Promantis started it. I think they started it, yeah. And if you guys aren't familiar, Promantis is, is a, like a burger sub shop, and they take a burger and they load it up with fries. But if you go to other restaurants, you get a salad, your salad's going to come with fries. Like you get a dessert and there's fries on the side. It's like, <laughs> I really love fries here. It's a big potato thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. I remember because I think it was, it was the fries, the coleslaw, everything was just put in the sandwich. And I thought, okay, I'll order it. That kind of sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. I'll probably just pull it off and, and eat it separately. And I took my first bite and went, all right, I'm sold. Yeah, I'm, it works. I'm done. I'm happy here. Yeah. And I've only ever seen them, um, and I think uh, I was at one of the one of the original locations in, in downtown Pittsburgh, and and I I've only ever seen them driving through Pennsylvania as you're close. So I'm not sure how far that chain spreads, but it's definitely something I look forward to every time I'm in the area. 
Okay, but away from food. Uh, okay. I want to come back to this because you're a creator. Uh, mm -hmm. You're obviously someone who takes uh, things very seriously. Um, you also have a podcast. We didn't talk about the podcast, actually. Let's, let's get into the podcast. You, uh, you have been on different podcasts, but this is uh, one, of the, one of the latest ones you're doing. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, the Creators Cast is a podcast for creators and the things they make. So basically, I have people on, uh, artists, I have authors, I have editors, I have photographers, I have musicians, basically people who make stuff. They, they come on the show and, and we just talk about what they make, how they make it, and, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, well, that's kind of cool. And it's a weekly podcast, Creators Cast. You can find it at scottking.info. Is that the... Uh, it's on my website. It's, it's on Apple. It's on Stitcher. It's in all the regular places. And it kind of evolved as that... When I, my first book came out back in the day, it was a graphic novel, and I started doing the rounds for, for podcasts. A lot of podcasts were really bad. Um, so then, then I got into self-publishing, and I was starting to do more rounds for podcasts. And, and some of the interviews were like, you go on the show, and they're like, so you wrote a book. And that's their only question. Like, they didn't bother to look up the name <laughs> of the book or, or anything else about me, or you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so the, the podcast kind of happened. I was like, well, I want a place that I – you know, the, the questions are researched. I know who the people are that are coming on. I've taken the time. I'm going to ask them real questions. Right. I'm going to be an active listener. And, and that's kind of how it evolved. And now we're 140 some episodes. Oh, that's cool. And I love the fact that you're going with creators. So you're going with people creating from all different areas, like yourself, mm -hmm. right? Photography right. And, and gaming and uh, obviously audio. And, and, and again, you write fiction and nonfiction. And, and I did want to ask you about the difference. Do you, do you have a different sort of mindset when you're, when you're working on a, a obviously more fantasy related stuff compared to the. the well, my, my goal growing up was always that I, I wanted to go into the, the screenwriting and because that's not a reliable job. I kind of always said, okay, I'm going to fall back on, I want to be a college professor okay. because I really love teaching. And so we got to a point where Lisa's career or my career kind of had to take charge and although I was teaching college, what I made as a college professor, even at tenure track for your university was nothing compared to what she was making as a chemical engineer. Wow. So I kind of had to put that on the side so that we can move to Texas and, and do her whole thing. Right. And, and I just kind of miss it. I, I really miss teaching. And that's kind of where the, the nonfiction books came from. It's like, well, I still want to have that connection with the readers. I still want to you know, work with students and help them grow and help them get better because as someone who's, who's been in the classroom, you really learn from teaching. So even just the act of, of writing my books and the way I write the books, I, I still grow as a creator. It still helps me. Plus, I could help people on the other side too. Okay. So you've taken something like how to write a novel in five days then, for example. And that's something mm -hmm. that you continually use. Um, has, has that been one of your more successful uh, book projects? Uh, the five-day novel and finish the script are... are my my biggest sellers those are the ones that resonate the most with mm -hmm. readers. oh that's great so do you still follow do you still follow that um <laughs> the five day oh no it, it, if you read the five day novel it basically what the book is is i said okay i wonder if i could write a book in five days because i heard about these romance authors who are crazy and they write a book in one day i was like well i'm not stupid i can't <laughs> do one day i'm gonna try five days and so i did it and it worked okay um but I, but I learned through the process this is not something I want to do, even though I, I can do it. And okay. I talk about that in the book. So it's the process that you figured out, and, and mm -hmm. then it can be, it can be uh, con contracted or expanded. Right, generally. exactly. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That's cool. Um, in terms of, uh, and I think I wanted to get into that, in terms of the mindset that you get in, in the difference between writing fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you talked a little bit about um, because you enjoyed that teaching, you missed that element of helping other people. When you, when you sit down, so for example, you know, tomorrow morning, Lisa's going to get up and go to work. You're going to get up and go to work, the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. Do you know what you're writing tomorrow? Do you know what project? Is it all, is it all slated out like a week in advance or anything like that? Uh, yeah, right now I'm, I'm wrapping up the rewrites on uh, Outline Your Novel, which is my next nonfiction book. Okay. And then from there, I have a little opening where I'm not sure what I want to write. And then come January, I get to start on my, my fantasy series again. Okay. And is that, is that considered like a treat? Like once you finish some, some task, you say, okay, this I, I need to get done. And this one I really want to play with. Is that no, not normally? It's kind of more like I've been working really hard and like I wrote two books in the past like four weeks. 
um, that are be coming out next year. And because I wrote them so quickly, because Lisa was out of town for work and I had nothing else to do, I kind of just have an opening in my schedule. I was like, ooh, I can do anything. So it's like, well, I might write another Choose Your Own Adventure. Or maybe I'll write like a one-day novella that's like 20,000 words and then write a book about writing a one-day novella. Or <laughs> it's, it's just kind of whatever I want and I haven't decided yet what that's going to be. But right now, it's outline your novel and then something and then I, I go back into the, the full fantasy series. Oh, that is that is fun. That that must be an enjoyable uh, an enjoyable experience to be able to have that open endedness too. Well, why why do this if I'm not enjoying it? Because I could make money working a real job. I could go back to teaching college, especially here where, where you know there are universities. But I could now get to kind of set my own schedule and work on what excites me. And and once you understand the the business side of being a self published author, and you understand how marketing works and how to use ads. As long as you are frugal in how you spend your money, you're going to make it back in the end. Like it's, it's, it's really hard not to earn back money on a book. It might take you two or three years, the worst case scenario, but you're going to make it back. And then the rest of your life, you're going to keep on making money on that book. That's just kind of how it works. And, 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 and taking that mindset, knowing that, that I can pay my bills as it is right now, I kind of have that little freedom. Excellent. That's fantastic. So because this is the Stark Reflections on mm-hmm. writing and publishing podcast, I'm wondering if there are any reflections that you've made recently about your own career, your own path as a creator, as a writer um, that you are thinking about um, or you're, you're contemplating. I think for someone who's getting into self-published, it's, it's important to understand that you need to know what you, what you want out of it. And then, and then beyond that, if you want to be successful, there's, there's more hats you have to wear. So I, I came up from, from academia. I, I went into it thinking I'm going to teach writing. I, I really love the art and craft of writing. The craft is kind of my jam. But if you want to make it a self-publisher, you can't just be craft-focused. You have to understand there is a marketing side. You need to know how to use AMS ads and Facebook ads. And you need to find the balance that works for you. There's some authors, especially in the indie field, who feel, you know what, the money is the most important thing to them. And guess what? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with them feeling that way. And if it, it works for them and their business plan, that's, that's, that's amazing. That doesn't work for my business plan, but that doesn't mean that my business plan is better or worse. It just means that we all need to know what works for us as authors and make sure that you're willing to wear other hats because if you aren't willing, you probably aren't going to be successful. You kind of have to find a balance that works for you. That's fantastic. That is something great to reflect on. Thank you for that. Now, just in closing, uh, mm-hmm. let's uh, let the listeners know where they can find you, how they can connect with you, social media, et cetera. That's, that's sure. Nice. My, my website is www.scottking.info. Uh, I am on Twitter at, at Scott King. And then my books are just all on Amazon. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Yeah, sure. Happy to be here. I wanted to reflect on something that Scott said in the interview that really sticks out for me. I mean, he talked about the balance of writing, which is fantastic. But then he was talking about the balance of spending and earning. He talked about how much it may cost for a book. But the fact that that book keeps on making money years later, the money that's coming in from it may never end. And that makes me want to look at the cost and investment and return for authors. Now, this is specifically for making an ebook. Now, for an ebook, at the low end, you're probably going to spend somewhere like $300 and maybe at the higher end, $3,000. Yes, you can do it completely for free. Yes, it can cost you nothing. But usually with some sort of professionals involved, whether it's editing or cover design or whatever, at the low end it's $300, and by the high end it's about $3,000. Now, assuming that your book price in U.S. dollars is $499, you're going to make back 70% of that uh, at the major retailers like Kindle, Kobo, iBooks, Nook, uh, etc., uh, which would net you about $3.49 per every unit sale. Now let's do a little bit of investment math here. To earn back $300, you need to sell 86 copies. And to earn back $3,000, you need to sell 860 copies. But what if it were priced at 99 cents? 
Now that would earn you 35% via Kindle Direct Publishing, which is the platform that most people are familiar with, and, and that 35% is a standard going rate. I, I am aware that Kobo Writing Life actually offers 45% if you're priced below $2.99, so you're getting $0.45, cents, but in a nutshell you're making 35 to $0.45 cents per unit sale at that $0.99 cent price point. Now I'll go back to Kindle as an example since most people are familiar with it. For that $0.95 cents and the $0.35 cents that you would make, you'd need to sell 857 copies to earn back the $300. Or you would need to sell 8,571 copies to earn back that $3,000. So that's some of the investment just based on two typical price points that you may want to use. You can use a spreadsheet and do the math at $1.99, $2.99, $5.99, etc. so that you can plan things out. And I do recommend that you do take a look at that. Take a look at the prices for the book that you've created and where the top 25, the top 50 books in that category are priced to get an idea of what the market will bear. Again, this example is only in U.S. dollars, and I strongly recommend you price in more than U.S. dollars, and it only looks at two price points. But the whole purpose of this exercise is for you, like Scott, to think about the long term. Are you planning on earning this back in the first 90 days that the book has been released? Are you planning on earning this money you've invested back in the first year, in the first two years, in the first three years? Scott mentions it may take years to earn back that investment but one of the wonderful things about digital publishing is you publish the book today and that book can be earning you money years later. I first self-published a print-on-demand version of my short story collection One Hand Screaming in 2004. A few years later I published the ebook edition of that book. I still earn a little bit of money from it every single year. No, this book is not earning me millions of dollars. It's basically earning me a little bit of money every year, but it's a book I published well over 10 years ago that's still bringing in income. That's part of my long-term strategy of investing in myself as a writer and as a publisher. What's your strategy? What is your cost? What is your investment? And what is your expected return? something important to reflect on. Thanks for joining me in this episode of Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing. Again, this is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. We'll catch you next week in Episode 8. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.